This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews, and I'm joined, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry and Dr. Henry. Um, big, big goings on this week at MDH because it is Suicide Prevention Week, um, something we're doing across some of our sister podcasts, and, and so a lot of focus on that this week, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you to the show, of course, and, and to... Um, just bring some light to what we've got going on this week. Well, a uh, very interesting uh, suicide prevention week. I wasn't aware. It's um, a very serious problem and very serious things are being done to address it. So it's nice. It gets a little headline. Yep. And um, by the way, I love your intro music. That's, uh, <laughs> well, oh, that's a very nice signature tune. I like it. Everybody gets relaxed and ready to go. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you, normally that we do that after the fact, but tonight's the first night that we're going to, we just put it right in there. I like it. Yeah, all right. So this week we've got a really interesting show um, coming up later, Clinical Correlation with Dr. Yerkowitz, as always, and we'll get to this week in hematology oncology. But let's interview or introduce our interview guest, Dr. Fagenbaum. He wrote a book called Chasing My Cure, uh, where it, he got one of the diseases he was, you know, dealing with or treating as a physician in a very fascinating scientific interview, and he'll be on one of our sister shows coming up later as well. Well, it was a really interesting interview that uh, we're about to hear. He is a, an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, up the street from where I work at Pennsylvania Hospital. And he has the unusual aspect on an illness of having it. And he's very open about it. He's been on Good Morning America. And that's Castleman's disease. So it's rare. And when he got it, and as he'll detail, you can have anything from a little to a lot. He was very sick in the ICU, nearly died, and realized that if someone were going to do something about this, it better be him. Who knows better than how to deal with it? Someone's been through it. And it's a, it's kind of an orphan disease and needs a lot of research and a lot of interest. And so he's really carrying that flag and uh, doing some of this original research himself. We got into etiology, symptoms, manifestations, and therapy and research. So it was a really great interview. Yeah, it was... Uh, it, 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 you must have a different sense of drive if you you know you are one of the people you're trying to treat in the short term and um, help out in the long term with regard to research. So what a, what a fascinating perspective. And his book, uh, as we drop this episode, his book has been out for two days, depending on when you're listening to this. It's called Chasing My Cure. And I, I uh, yeah, it was one of the better interviews we've listened, we've done for, for sure. I agree. I, I haven't read it, but uh, when we talk about it on the podcast, it sounds most interesting. So it's going to be on my list of reads this year before the year is out. And coming up after the interview, of course, is Clinical Correlation, Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. She selects topics and, and brings us the human side of hematology, oncology care. It's a segment uh, meant to kind of put a bow on what we're talking about. Oftentimes, you can be very clinical or very scientific, and she reminds us that um, medicine is about people, stories are about people. Uh, this week, another interesting topic, it's when the friends and the family of patients with cancer experience compassion fatigue. You know, each week, Nick, I think she just can't do another great title mm-hmm. topic talk. And each week she surprises me. And it's another great headline, Compassion Fatigue. Many of our cancer patients are sick for a long time. They don't quite make a change, don't get better, don't get worse. And the families care and love and get involved. And it's tiring. And they feel guilty because they don't want to be tired. But nevertheless, if they're normal and they're human, they get tired. So she addresses that in her talk in her interview so it should be most interesting absolutely it's so fascinating as as someone who hasn't been burdened with that in in my family or my personal life you imagine that there must be so much momentum and positivity at the beginning but it is a long haul so we're glad we've got someone like dr yerkowitz to address um, a topic like that okay let's get to this week in hemodology and oncology Uh, this news story is from a Paper in Advances in Radiation Oncology. The, the headline is Saber offers surgery alternative for localized renal cell carcinoma. Carcinoma, excuse me. Saber, of course, stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy. So for patients with localized renal cell carcinoma, Saber may be an effective alternative to surgery, according to findings from this study published in Advances in Radiation Oncology. The authors did point out in the study that uh, Saber may be able to overcome some resistance that preclinical data has reported in RCC uh, by delivering highly conformal dose escalation radiation. So in the study, 347 patients with RCC from the National Cancer Database were treated with either Saber or uh, and oh, with Saber and not surgery. Most patients did 
not have a systemic therapy. After a median follow-up of 36 months, ranging from 1 to 156 months, median overall survival across all patients was 58 months, uh, Sabre was most effective for patients with non-metastatic disease who had uh, smaller tumors. Dr. Henry, I find this, this really interesting because anytime there's an alternative course uh, that may be safer or at least something to consider with the patient, I, I think that's a really interesting development. No, oh, I, I agree completely. Of course, it's non-invasive, and our radiation colleagues have really just run with their various techniques, their kinds of radiation, their techniques to deliver it. Uh, I like the acronym here, SABER, because we have gamma knife, which, of course, mm-hmm. is not surgery, but it's like surgery. Here we have the SABR, so it's like you're taking a SABER, and, but you're not cutting anybody. And so this is an alternative. We'll have to see how it compares to, to a surgical approach. Yes. And... Um, downstream complications or not in effectiveness and as you point out progression free and overall survival so but it's a it's a very interesting idea and another potential non-invasive therapy for patients with this tumor yeah no, that non-invasive aspect must be really attractive to people who might have uh, problems very. with that and, and surgery recovery is obviously intense and in my opinion that is one aspect the other aspect is that this is another tool in the toolkit and anytime you can you know weaponize yourself as a as a clinician that's a, that's a good thing Agree. Agree. I think it's a great idea, and we'll see how it plays out. All right. So it's Suicide Prevention Week. Uh, the episode of Blood and Cancer is is going to be. Uh, well, excuse me. We have a sister podcast, Post Call Podcast, is going to be publishing a special edition uh, lecture on physician suicide. If you feel so inclined, uh, there will be a link to that in the show notes, where you can just hear a lecture um, from an, from an expert on physician suicide. And if you know anyone, um, take the appropriate steps. Or if you're struggling with that, that's that's a podcaster. Uh, that can lead you in the right direction to kind of get help and, and maybe empathize a little bit. So we wanted to bring some awareness to that. Dr. Henry, I really appreciate you coming on. This is one of our best interviews, and I'm really excited to hear it. I agree, and also show notes have already been done by our Pennsylvania Hospital resident, Sue Landy. I've seen them. They're very good to the point. So on the webpage, mdh.com slash hematology-oncology, if you're so inclined to read or review. But here comes the interview. Welcome to this podcast. I'm Dr. David Henry, host of the podcast Blood and Cancer, which hope you will enjoy as we get into another feature of this weekly airing podcast that you can get on uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast features. And so today I'm delighted to be talking to a close friend in terms of geography down the street at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. David Fagenbaum, who is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm actually a bit excited to do this piece because, uh, as our listeners will hear, you have some special interests and discussion regarding this diagnosis of Castleman's, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And to our generally hematology-oncology audience, we're most all familiar with that term, but not always exactly what it is. So could we start with... Definition, what is the Castleman's disease? How would you define it? Sure. So Castleman disease really describes a group of disorders that all share a common histopathological appearance under the microscope. So there are certain features that Benjamin Castleman back in 1954 described, and that is now those features are now what we look for when we, when we diagnose Castleman disease. But really, Castleman disease, as I mentioned earlier, just really describes a group of disorders. There's unicentric Castleman disease, we have a single and large lymph node and typically quite mild symptoms. Surgical excision is curative for most of those patients. Then there are two forms of what's called multicentric Castleman disease. So you have multiple regions of enlarged lymph nodes disseminated throughout your body. And those lymph nodes all have that same appearance under the microscope that you see in unicentric Castleman disease, but there's multiple regions. For patients with multicentric Castleman disease, they get extremely ill. So uh, there's two forms of multicentric Castleman disease. One is caused by human herpes virus 8. So patients who do not have a, uh, a, a complete immune system, they're not able to um, uh, prevent replication of the HHV8 virus. So in these patients, often HIV positive individuals, they'll develop uh, an uncontrolled HHV8 infection, which leads to a cytokine storm. Patients get very sick with multi-organ failure due to an almost sepsis-like clinical picture. Fortunately, those patients can be treated well with rituximab um, to deplete the the host for HHV-8. And then the last type is what we call HHV-8 negative or idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease. As as 
our, our colleagues in the line will know anytime you put idiopathic before a disease name, you know that it's, uh, it's not well understood and we don't know what causes it. But in idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease, you get the same cytokine storm that you see in HHV at associated MCD, and patients get extremely sick often. Um, but there is no virus. We can't find the HHV-8 virus, and we don't know what causes the cytokine storm. So in this last group, IMCD, idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease, we treat those patients typically with interleukin-6 blockade, um, which works for a portion of patients. But unfortunately, there's major unmet need for the people who don't get better with IL-6 blockade. So the HHV-8, the same virus, always present in Kaposi's sarcoma. So does it ever exist both in the same patient? Yes, actually, you can absolutely see patients that will have both KS and also um, HHV-associated multicenter Castleman disease. The pathology, maybe say a word or two about what it might look like under the microscope? Sure. Um, so the, the really the hallmark sign of a Castleman disease lymph node are what are called atrophic or regressed germinal centers. So rather than having a nice plump germinal center with, uh, filled with B cells that are going through maturational steps, Castleman disease patients have these atrophic or B cell depleted germinal centers. So they have small um, germinal centers with wide mantle zones instead of the typical thin mantle zone around a normal germinal center. And then Castleman's patients also have typically have increased numbers of plasma cells in the interfollicular space as well as increased number of blood vessels in the interfollicular space. So it's actually a quite a challenging diagnosis because what you just heard me say is there's nothing in a Castleman disease lymph node that you don't see in other lymph nodes, but it's just that there's more or less of various things. So it's really a challenging disease because there's it's really a spectrum uh, disorder, and, and, and you see uh, an exaggeration of some things and less of other things, and that has to lead a hematopathologist, typically a very experienced hematopathologist, in order to make the diagnosis. Yeah, and so I'm thinking then, of course, I, we all are clinicians seeing patients in the office, and how might a patient, he or she, actually, is there a gender difference, male, female? There is, right now, what we know is that there's a slightly increased um, uh, female uh, proportion of patients with unicenter Castleman disease and a slightly increased male proportion of patients with multicenter Castleman disease, but it's very subtle. It's about 45 to 55 percent based on, on our studies. So it's not it's not something that you can really use to help to guide um, uh, your clinical suspicion. So almost an even split. So I go see a patient <clears throat> in the office. The the symptom that he or she might give to me sounds like anywhere from very vague and nonspecific <clears throat> to flagrant. You're exactly right. So um, you might have a patient come in who has a single solitary and large lymph node. And maybe their PCP um, sent them on to you and said, you know, we've got a patient with a really big lymph node. Maybe they're in their mid-20s. They sound like a classic Hodgkin lymphoma patient. Um, but what will happen is you'll go in to do a lymph node biopsy. And, and typically, lymph node biopsies are done because of concern for lymphoma. And the lymph node will be reviewed by the pathologist. And they'll say, this doesn't look like lymphoma. This, these are these atrophic germinal centers in large mantle zones this looks more like Castleman disease. And then they'll run tests to look for clonality. And if there is clonality within the lymph node tissue, then they'll say this is not Castleman disease. This is Hodgkin lymphoma or it is T-cell lymphoma. But if there is no clonality within the lymph node and it's got this Castleman appearance, then they'll diagnose it as unicentric Castleman disease. Um, but as you said, the other end of the spectrum is typically a patient who's either going to show up to your office after having a couple weeks of flu-like symptoms, maybe some weight loss, uh, and, and maybe some fluid accumulation in their legs, um, but just feeling generally really unwell, almost like a really acute EBV presentation. Um, they might come into your office, and uh, you might do some blood work and see the patient's anemic, thrombocytopenic, um, having starting to have low ab ab uh, albumin levels, slightly increasing creatinine, just things that are looking a little off. And at that stage, um, you might note that there are enlarged lymph nodes throughout the patient's body. So you might send them for a CT scan and find out that there's really disseminated lymphadenopathy. So again, you'll be very concerned that maybe this is a really aggressive uh, form of lymphoma and that this patient is, is going to decline quite rapidly after that biopsy. And so um, at that stage, if the biopsy is done and, and it comes back as idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease, then you really want to start treatment right away because these patients get sick very quickly. And, of course, if it comes back as hhb associated multicenter Castleman disease, you also want to start treatment quickly because rituximab is so effective in those patients. Um, but what's more common with these MCD patients isn't that they'll show up to your clinic. It's that they'll show up to the emergency department and then they'll get hospitalized because these patients get very sick very They're quickly. Very sick very quickly, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and as you said, you know, it's kind of nonspecific at first, but then these patients in the in the hospital, what is a little bit more specific and what maybe should get you thinking it's Castleman's is fluid accumulation. These patients will gain 50 to 100 pounds of fluid in anasarca, um, and that's one of the things that, that helps us to think, you know, maybe this isn't, um, maybe this isn't lupus or maybe it's not uh, lymphoma. So absent HIV, this could be anybody. So there's no particular demographic? That's exactly right. Okay. All right. So we have a readily available patient to tell us exactly what it feels like, and that's <laughs> you. Um, I saw that's, your piece right. for our listeners. I saw your piece in Good Morning America, GMA. It's really beautifully done piece. I'm sure it's searchable on Google with some uh, graphics of what you looked like before and during a flare and diagnosis. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you came to be diagnosed, and um, then we'll get into more about what you're doing about it. Sure. So um, I was a healthy third-year medical student here at the University of Pennsylvania. I wanted to become a clinical oncologist. Uh, I had lost my mom to cancer a few years before and wanted to to go into the field in order to treat patients like my mom. And I was in my third year at Penn when um, I started noticing flu-like symptoms, fatigue, night sweats, abdominal pain, um, nausea, I uh, started noticing fluid accumulating in my, in my legs and um, didn't really know what was going on. Um, but I really wanted to get through, an emer- uh, through a, a clinical exam that I, that I needed to do for medical school. So I got through my, my clinical exam and I went down to the emergency department. And um, the blood work they did indicated that there was liver, kidney, and bone marrow dysfunction. Uh, and so they hospitalized me and, and they found that I had um, disseminated lymphadenopathy. And there was certainly concern early on for lymphoma, but I got so sick so quickly. Um, I had a retinal hemorrhage and went blind in my left eye. I gained about 100 pounds of fluid all over my body, tremendous anasarca, and, and, I, and I got very, very, very sick very quickly. Ended up being hospitalized in the intensive care unit here at Penn. And unfortunately, um, there was no diagnosis for quite some time. I was eventually diagnosed uh, when a lymphoid biopsy was done. But as you can expect, this is a rare disease presenting in sure, kind, yeah. kind of non-specific ways. And um, so fortunately, I ended up being diagnosed and, and got first-line treatment. But unfortunately, I've had a quite refract- refractory case. So I, I got treated the first time, got into remission, but I've now actually had five of these uh, life-threatening flares, each time um, the disease coming back with a vengeance and each time requiring weeks in the hospital. And this is all, you described this fluid and multi-organ system of effect and failure. This is all the cytokine storm. It's exactly right. You know, IMCD, uh, and of course here at Penn, where we do a lot of CART therapy, IMCD is indistinguishable from cytokine release syndrome that you see in patients following um, CART therapy. And so basically IMCD is kind of like the naturally occurring CRS that happens, you know, if you give someone um, CAR, CAR T cell therapy, and actually it's treated the same way. So tocilizumab, which was initially developed in Japan for Castleman disease, is actually the treatment of choice, as you know, um, for patients who get CRS following CART therapy. And there's an interesting Castleman's connection that, I, that I'll share briefly, and that's that uh, tocilizumab was developed in Japan um, based on the initial work that found elevated interleukin-6 in a few Castleman disease patients. And a, a good colleague, a good friend of mine and, and colleague, Kazu Yoshizaki, back in the 90s, he did work to try to develop a treatment to block interleukin-6 in Castleman disease patients. And um, he developed this antibody first um, in, ma- in mice, and then when he was ready to try it in humans, um, at this stage, this is early 90s, when monoclonal antibodies were, what, were not nearly as ubiquitous as they are today. Yeah. And he decided, um, or, or so the story goes, I had heard, that he decided to try the drug on himself to prove that it was safe, that it was okay to take wow. what is now tocilizumab. And when I asked him about that, he said, no, uh, I, I didn't give the drug to myself. The nurse, she gave me the drug. And I said, exactly, Kazu, that's exactly what I thought you did. Um, so he gave the drug to himself, he survived, um, and they went on to do a, a trial of tocilizumab in Castleman disease patients. It went on to get a, a approval in Japan for multicenter Castleman disease, but was never studied here in the United States. Um, but of course, it got approval for rheumatoid arthritis and was used off-label in CART therapy. And it's an IL-6 antibody. That's exactly right. Uh, do I recall, siltuximab, is that IL-6 so antibody or am I thinking of something only, else? You know, you're exactly right. Siltuximab so is the only FDA-approved drug for idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease. So tocilizumab targets the receptor for IL-6. That was approved in Japan and, of course, is available in the U.S. for other indications. 
but siltuximab was developed about a decade ago here in the United States for specifically for idiopathic multicenter capsulin disease, and it worked incredibly well, well tolerated, and with a nice side effect pro- or a good side effect profile for somewhere between a third and, a, and one half of patients um, with idiopathic MCD. They'll respond well to drug, and they will it will maintain them in in a, in a in a good remission and durable remission. Unfortunately, there's about a half of patients that don't respond to IL-6 blockade, and it's those 50% of IMCD patients um, that we've uh, focused most of our attention on identifying new drugs for. So if I recall, the FDA label for siltuximab excludes HIV, which, as you've highlighted, is a demographic of this occurs. Do you know why that is? Why not HIV? Yeah, so the reason is is that... um, HHV8 associated MCD, uh, which we talked about caused by the same virus that causes KS, that almost always occurs in the setting of HIV infection. There are cases of patients that will be immunosuppressed for another reason. But generally, if you're, if you're HIV infected and you have multicenter Castleman disease, there's a 99.999% chance that you have HHV8 associated MCD. So your disease is driven by the HHV8 virus. And actually, those patients do really, really well with rituximab. So depleting B cells is, is really the treatment of choice for HHV8-associated multicentric calcium disease. For the patients that are HHV8 negative, which is what siltuximab is indicated for, those patients, there is no virus. B cell depletion is not nearly as effective. You really need, need to target interleukin-6 directly. But so, so that's kind of why clinically it's important to go IL-6 blockade in the idiopathic and B cell depletion in the HHV8 positive cases. But from a, um, a development perspective, the reason siltuximab was never studied in HHV8 associated MCD in those uh, HIV positive cases is because it's known that the HHV8 virus actually signals for a viral interleukin 6. And that particular viral interleukin 6 protein is actually not bound and neutralized by the anti human interleukin 6 antibody. So when they, when they figured that out in the lab, they decided they didn't want to try the drug in HHV8 or HIV-positive patients because they didn't think that their antibody would bind to the viral analog of interleukin-6. Fascinating. Wow. Well, um, that actually helps explain to me where I do see this sometimes in HIV patients. And they go, gee, if I could only get that siltuximab, this explains why not. And rituxan has worked well, rituximab. Worked so, very well. So, of course, I think you did exactly what someone should do with your expertise, your medical knowledge, and your diagnosis. You wrote a book. So uh, tell us a bit about your book and when is it available? Sure. It's called Chasing My Cure, and it's coming out on Tuesday. And and really, the book is all about Tuesday, how I September went Tuesday, September 10? Oh, yes. Yeah, Tuesday, September 10th. That's it. exactly okay. right. All right. Um, and the book is really all about how I went from being a healthy third-year medical student to being a critically ill patient, um, nearly dying five times, and in the midst of those flares and remissions and relapses, deciding that I could no longer wait and hope that someone somewhere would identify treatments for patients that were IL-6 refractory with IMCD, that if I really wanted a treatment, if I wanted to, to live um, and, and survive, uh, at least in the short to medium term, then I needed to get to work. And so getting to work for me meant um, beginning to conduct laboratory research here at Penn, also starting a foundation called the Castle Disease Collaborative Network, and really pushing with everything that I had to identify a treatment for my disease. And actually, over the course of, of a couple of years, the work that I did in the lab here at Penn, I identified that the mTOR signaling pathway was activated to a severely high level in my lymph node tissue compared to related diseases and compared to controls. And because of this uh, uh, mTOR hyperactivation that I found in my own samples, I hypothesized that inhibiting mTOR with a drug like serolimus that's been around for 25 years could maybe be an effective treatment for preventing relapses. And so I actually started on serolimus in early 2014 as the first idiopathic multicentric calcium disease patient to be treated with serolimus. And um, I have been in remission for five and a half years. I, I, I certainly know that um, that nothing's guaranteed, and I know that, that this disease could certainly come back at any time. But this remission has allowed me to get married to, to my wife and, and for my, my wife and I to have a daughter a year ago. And so this journey um, of, of ups and downs, highs and lows, battling this disease and, and nearly succumbing to the disease, um, uh, that's, that's what I wrote about in my book. And, and really the reason why I wrote it is because I learned so much about life from each of the times I nearly died, lessons that 
I never knew before I got sick lessons that I, I want to share with others that they don't have to go through what I went through to learn those lessons. Well, uh, brief editorial comment. I've always thought to myself that every doctor should be a patient at least once in his or her life because yeah. it gives you a very new understanding of what it's like to be a patient that we don't always realize. Uh, before we leave the serolimus, what's your dose and or would you recommend and what are your levels that you aim for? Sure. So um, for me, I, I do three milligrams a day. We're looking, we're, we're aiming for a kidney transplant dose so that's anywhere between five and 15 nanograms per milliliter. So it's really that kidney transplant level. Of course, when I was first started on it, we didn't have any guidance for what dose because I was the first IMCD patient, but we did turn to the ALPS literature, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, which is another one of these kind of strange autoimmune lymphoproliferative sort of diseases like Castleman disease. And in those patients, they typically get um, kidney transplant dosing uh, of serolimus. So we went with that dosing, and actually we've just begun a clinical trial here at the University of Pennsylvania with Adam Cohen and Sunita Nasta as the lead investigators to give this drug, serolimus, to 26 patients over the next year, all of the patients will need to have uh, relapsed or been refractory to IL-6 blockade, and they will need to be inter uh, idiopathic multicenter calcium disease patients. And this is a, a rare disease, IMCD, um, but it, I don't think it's, it's not as rare as I think a lot of us in the medical field um, may suspect. Um, overall, all three forms of calcium disease account for about 5,000 new diagnoses each year in the U.S. And between those three subgroups, there's about it's broken up about one third, one third, one third. So there's approximately 1,500 idiopathic multicenter Castleman disease diagnoses each year. As I mentioned, about a third to half of them will get better with IL-6 blockade. So you're left with somewhere around 500 to 1,000 patients diagnosed somewhere in the U.S. that might be uh, in need of a drug other than IL-6 blockade. And as of as of right now chemotherapy is really the only option. And for me, that's what saved my life. I would get multi-agent chemotherapy with a, a, a multiple myeloma uh, combination, VDT pace. That was the typical regimen that I would get, which would actually turn my disease around and get me into remission. But um, unfortunately, you know, it came with a lot of side effects. And, and I also would, would relapse as soon as my immune system would reconstitute itself about a year later. Um, but since I've been on serolimus, I've not had any relapses. That's terrific. And, and the serolimus uh, applicable to HIV, Castleman associated or not yet studied? Not yet studied. Um, I think that there's been less effort um, to identify new treatments within the HIV associated cases, mainly because rituximab, there's been some really great long term data recently that's shown that patients treated with rituximab, over 90% of patients will go into a remission many of them durable remissions on rituximab, mm -hmm. and, any, and the ones that are not durable, retreatment with rituximab will put these patients back into remission. So there's fortunately uh, a really effective therapy through rituximab, but also um, if necessary, um, uh, doxorubicin will sometimes be added or atopicide to the regimen, and again, that will help to control the disease. So we've not tried serolimus yet, but I think for those patients who don't get better with rituximab, don't get better with added chemotherapy, I think it would be really exciting to start to study to see if, if serolimus could have a benefit. We just submitted a paper to blood that's currently uh, under review where we looked at mTOR signaling across all subtypes of Castleman disease and also compared to a number of related diseases. And we did see, in fact, that, that HHV8 and HIV-associated MCD patients they likewise also had increased mTOR activation in tissue relative to related disease controls, even relative to Hodgkin lymphoma. So, um, so it may, in fact, be an, an exciting option for um, HIV-associated cases as well. Well, just to add to that, um, I see a lot of HIV Kaposi sarcoma and the liposomal doxorubicin is phenomenally effective. Some who fail get a taxane. And then my go-to third line that has not failed me is serolimus. So, really? Yeah. Um, with about oh, the wow. levels and the target uh, dosing that you've set. So uh, interesting since they seem to share somewhat a, a common feature. Well, That's I want, really interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. So I want to bring it on home. You've already talked about the now and some of the future. Anything else as you look beyond the future future of what you see for other therapies for this interesting disease? Sure. So right now I mentioned the, the clinical trial that we're enrolling here at Penn. We're mm -hmm. really excited about mTOR inhibition as a, as a potential route for IL-6 refractory patients. We do know from some off-label use of serolimus that it's been given to about 10 patients with IMCD that were refractory to other therapies. And about half of them have had um, uh, notable improvements. 
However, about half of them, particularly the ones that were very ill, like in the intensive care unit, did not improve with serolimus. And so we are, are really focused as a group. We want to see what proportion of patients will get better with serolimus. So we're also actively investigating what are some, um, maybe you could say, some bigger guns uh, that are not yet or not quite chemotherapy, but some additional agents, um, maybe some TKIs uh, that, that we use in those patients that don't respond to IL-6 blockade or mTOR inhibition. Um, maybe some that can really shut off this cytokine storm and the loop that we have going on in patients. So, so we're, we're really actively um, doing a lot of basic and translational research to look for new drug targets beyond mTOR, beyond IL-6 um, that can help us to shut off the cytokine storm. Because it looks like mTOR inhibition is particularly good if a patient is in remission um, to maintain remission, but to actually shut off the cytokine storm um, we need new agents, and so that's where my lab is particularly focused here at Penn. We also are really excited about off-label drug use generally and the idea that a drug like serolimus, um, you know, could be used and is available, um, you know, approved for one thing but could be used for others just as sure. you described using it in KS patients. And, and thinking as a lab, as we do research, really guiding the, the pathways and the cells and the, and, and the cytokines that we study really focusing on the ones where there are drugs that are already FDA approved. So if, in fact, we find dysregulation of that particular pathway or, or gene set, that, um, that we're poised to potentially uh, utilize drugs that are already FDA approved. Well, you know, with your expertise and your research, uh, those listening may want to run a case or send a case uh, for a study yeah. to you. Would you be comfortable giving out your email address for listeners to contact Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yes. Go, go right Please ahead. Feel free to contact me. I, I'm... All I do is think about Castleman disease all day, every day, so please feel free to reach out to me. My email is David, which is my first name, and then the first two letters of my last name, F-A um, for Fagenbaum, and that's at penmedicine.upen.edu. You can also learn a lot about the work that we're doing um, through a website called, for the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, and that's CD. And you can learn about the work we're doing, the science that we're, that we're pushing forward, and, and be happy to, to chat with you at any time. Well, I think it's a great way to close. I, I want to thank you very much for taking the time, your expertise, your personal journey, and your research, really in an area which uh, needs all of that. Uh, it's been just a pleasure to listen to and, and talk about. So I'll close by reminding our listeners you've been listening to Blood and Cancer, Dr. David Fagenbaum, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Penn and doing research and happy to talk to others about this disorder. You can uh, see our show notes on this podcast at our online journal called mdedge.com slash hematology dash oncology. And three of our residents here at Pennsylvania Hospital, Emily Breyer, Ronak Mystery, and Sue Landy are kind enough to listen to our podcast each week and do show notes. You can see show notes and references online at that space. And so once again, David, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. You're very welcome. Thanks, everyone. And that concludes the interview portion of our show this week. Remember, there are robust show notes available wherever notes are found in your app. We'll be right back with Clinical Correlation. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer. It's time now for Clinical Correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. I'm Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Today, I'd like to talk about an issue that faces many of our patients with blood disorders and cancer, compassion fatigue. It's a concept that refers to lessening compassion over time due to recurring emotional stressors. Because of the sheer frequency of these stressors, one has difficulty maintaining and displaying compassion over time. No one understands this concept more than our patients living with chronic illness, including many heme and onc patients. A woman I met in clinic recently told me about a patient support group where she shared her story. The most touching and relatable parts, she said, was when she talked about how the cards stopped coming. She carried a diagnosis of cancer, but one that is indolent, so it's like dealing with a chronic illness. She had to go to regular doctor's appointments, get blood tests and scans, get chemotherapy treatment with its host of side effects, 
worry about relapse, and deal with the complications of a compromised immune system. Initially, when she got the diagnosis, cancer, people in her life were beside themselves trying to help her. She was lucky to have a support group that offered help with her daily life and activities and offered compassion in the form of gifts and cards. Then, as she poignantly described it, the cards stopped coming. With each complication, her pool of support got smaller until it dwindled to only one or two devoted loved ones in her life. She didn't want to be a burden on her other friends, and they in turn seemed to fatigue of showing sympathy over each of her setbacks. This story, she told me in clinic, resonated the most in her support group. It's something nearly everyone with chronic illness has faced, but few talk about and validate for one another. There's no blame for friends and acquaintances who can't maintain that level of compassion commitment over time. It's really tough. But the lucky ones are the patients who have that one or two people who are by their side through the entire journey. Because it is a journey, after all. Not just a diagnosis, not just one event. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next week for Clinical Correlation. And that concludes episode 35 of Blood and Cancer. Let's get to this week's credits. Blood and Cancer is hosted by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. Our guest this week was Dr. David Fagenbaum. The Clinical Correlation segment is written, recorded, and produced by Dr. Alana Yurkowitz. MDH podcasts are produced by Mary Jo Dales. Denise Fulton, Kathy Scarbeck, fuck. MDH podcasts are produced by our editor-in-chief, Mary Jo Dales. Executive editors, Denise Fulton and Kathy Scarbeck, and multimedia editor Terry Rudd. Blood and Cancer is produced by Mary Ellen Schneider. Social media for Blood and Cancer is handled by Kyla Clark. I am your audio engineer, audio editor, and the producer of MD Edge Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Thanks for listening to Blood and Cancer by MD Edge. <laughs>